Well, I'll get started. I'm Keith Larson. I'm a scientist at Emile University. I uh, manage something called the Climate Impacts Research Center in Abasco, which most of you know is just a little bit to the west of here, not too far away. So anyway, uh, the Abasco Scientific Research Station has been around for about a century, and so we're going to learn a little bit about the science that's taken place there, how that's uh, uh, given us an idea about what's ha happening in the Arctic, uh, if I have time, I'll put it in a global perspective. And then finally, I might share a few opinions. There we are. We're in a very beautiful spot there, 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. Here's the research station. This is the original building right here, built in 1912 and operated since 1913. What makes the research station actually so special is the fact that this is one of the, the, the uh, weather station right here is one of the longest continuous where it hasn't moved to take the same measurements year after year, decade after decade, stations anywhere in the Arctic on the planet. You can see actually some of the, whoops, handwritten journals, because back then, of course, in 1913, they would look at instruments and write values down. And today we have modern instruments that are automated. But beyond the, uh, the fact that the research station's been there for about 100 years, there's some really interesting aspects of this landscape that actually give us insights into what the climate was, what the weather was before we had these weather stations. Here's a tree. It's a pine tree. And it was found on the bottom of a lake. Now, why is that important? Well, it turns out most of you might be familiar with the idea that if you look at a tree and you take a core, you can basically count back to the beginning and get the age of the tree. What you may not be familiar with, though, is the wood in between those lines actually represents the growth of that summer, and it captures a signature of the climate. So the trees don't live for one year, they live for many, many, many years, and they capture this signature. And in that signature, is a proxy for temperature. It includes information about the carbon dioxide. It tells us a lot about the climate. And it turns out that, of course, we don't have very old trees in Abasco or in Kiona, but it turns out that there's a lot of old trees at the bottom of lakes. And some, almost 30 years ago, some clever scientists thought, well, you know what? What would happen if we pull some of those lakes, those trees out of the lake, and then try to figure out how old these trees are, not just in the absolute age, but where they place on kind of a, a time scale. So this is actually a tree that's 7,000 years old. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And what we can see here is a climate reconstruction going back from the present back to 900 years. But if I had a wider screen, we actually have a plot that goes back 7,400 years. So not only is Abasco the, the research station with the longest continuous weather and climate data set in the world from measuring day by day, hour by hour, those kind of things of temperature, precipitation, and so on. But it's actually the longest climate sequence derived from tree rings in the world. It's 7,400 years old. So Abbas goes special for two reasons. And what's really important to look here is that you can see there's warm phases and there's cold phases. And the reason why I like to show this plot is that for people who are maybe more skeptical about, the, about climate change, whether it's real or not real, or whether it's important or not important, well, this actually validates one of the observations they've made, is that the climate is always changing. They're right, okay? The second thing that they're right about is, take a look here, here's kind of the present, you know, kind of industrial uh, period where we have the warming that we, we see today. But look, it was warm in the past as well. So when they say it was warm in the past, they're right. But now let me tell you why they're wrong. Well, they're often wrong. Is that when you look at periods like the medieval warming period, which was warmer, or you look at the little ice age, which is cooler, and you try to compare that to today, the reason why that's not a very valid comparison is because this period here, for example, wasn't a global warming event. So just like we have tree rings from Abasco, we have tree rings, we have sediment cores, we have uh, measurements that we can take by taking a, a, a core from the sediment of the ocean. And we have thousands of those from around the world. And what we can see is that if it was one, it was warmer in Abasco and in Northern Europe, 
this medieval warming period, it wasn't warm everywhere on the planet at the same time. So there's no evidence that these time periods are reflective of a global phenomenon. Whereas today, this warming that is characterized from the cheery rings right here and from the temperature um, uh, thermometers, I should say, in Otisco, is found in Greenland, it's found in the South Pole, it's found in Chicago, it's found in Stockholm, it's found in Lulio, it's found in Umeå. This is a global phenomenon. Now let's look at the let's look at this warming. This is data from Omosco. And if we start down here, this is kind of kind of how we typically see temperature data. A bunch of mean annual temperatures and then maybe some kind of moving average. And of course, you can see that it looks like that it's getting warmer here. But a much better way, the way we actually look at climate data versus looking at weather data. And climate meaning we have long term weather data that gives us a picture of the climate. So you can see that it was warm here and it was warm here. Just because it was warm in one year in the past and one year recently doesn't mean that climate change isn't real. We're not comparing climate when we compare two years, even if it's from a long time ago and today. We're comparing weather, okay? So what we do as scientists is we take a baseline period, which is typically the 30 years prior to this 30 year period, which in this case is 1961 to 1990. It's a little hard to see the gray block here, I apologize. And instead of looking at those mean annual temperatures individually, we take all of those 30 mean annual temperatures from that baseline period, we average them and they become zero. And then what we can do is we can compare every single year to that baseline average. And what we can see is that in the past there were cold years and warm years, cold years and warm years, but since 1989, with the exception of 2010, every year has been a warm year. Now we can say every year has been a warm year, but maybe a better way of saying it is that where is the cold winters? That's the interesting part of the story. The temperatures in Avisco have risen approximately 1.7 degrees since 1913. Now if you are someone who might be skeptical of, of, of uh, climate change, or you might be somebody who just um, understands the science maybe a little bit more deeply than other people, you might say, well, you know, Abisko is just one place. You know, Abisko, how do we know that's representative of, say, the Arctic in general? Well, here we go. Here is the NASA GISTEMP data set, so it's weather stations from across the Arctic. Well, actually, it's a global data set, but I've pulled out the Arctic data. I'm showing the exact same time period, 1913 to 2018, and we can see, indeed, there were cold years and warm years and cold years and warm years, but around 1986, we transitioned to every year being a warm year. Again, we lose those cold winters. Now, one thing you might also see here is that there seems to be more variation here, but that's because it's one station. We're here, this is an average of stations, and that removes some of that variation. But the pattern is the same. So we can indeed say that Abisko is representative of what's happening in the Arctic. Now, here's the same NASA GISTEM data set, but here's the global data set. And what you can see is essentially with the same baseline, the same time period, the same scale, we can see that the Arctic temperatures are rising twice the global rate. So you can see that the, about the average temperature change over the last century has been about one degree globally. And in Abisko, again, it's been about 1.7 degrees. So that creates some context for what we see in Abisko. Now, I apologize. These are new plots, and I need to get them fixed. But this is... Um, the Tornatresk, the seventh largest lake in Sweden. It's Sweden sea ice. Now on this axis is uh, day of the year, and this is when the lake freezes up, and this is when the lake breaks up. And the lower plot basically shows, and again I apologize for the small dots, I need to fix this. I mean, I just put this in here yesterday. Um, but what you can see is the total number of days the lake is ice free per year. And what we can see is that after about 1989, we get a long-term reduction of about 44 days per year. Now, why does that matter? Well, we keep hearing a lot about Arctic sea ice. And let me use this one graphic to illustrate why the Arctic is important. And I think this sums up the whole talk. I could stop it right here if I need to. The sun's energy that comes down and goes through our atmosphere, when it hits the ground, when it hits ice, it reflects 85 to 90% of that energy back up to space. That's awesome, isn't it? But when it hits a dark surface, like open water, 
it absorbs 90% of the energy. So when you start talking about large surfaces of the planet that have traditionally been covered with snow and ice, as they start to melt back, as that snow and ice starts to disappear, remember the winters are getting warmer. We had rain last week for almost 12 hours in August, okay? So as these winters get warmer, this ice melts back. It's changing the amount of energy that the Earth can store and then re-radiate because of the uh, melting sea ice, in this case, lake ice. So basically, this shows a pattern. If we have melting of snow and ice, it means we absorb more heat. We have a thinner atmosphere at the high latitudes, okay, because the, 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 the uh, Earth is a sphere, and so at the top, you know, we, uh, we have a thinner atmosphere than towards the equator. And so we get this positive feedback. So we get more energy absorption, which causes more ice to melt, which causes more energy absorption. Now, I've already started to answer this question, but I want to ask you, it says up there, when is the warming occurring? So raise your hand if you think that global warming, say, where we live in Kiona and Abisko, is it something that we get basically an even warming across the year? Do you think it's across the year? Do you think it's summer or winter? So across the year, what do you think? How many people think that global warming is primarily across the year at this latitude? Okay, how about summer? How many people think it's a summer phenomenon? A lot of, it makes sense because you know the summer is when it's warm. That's what we think of summer. But winter, how about raise your hand if you think it's winter? Well, I've already kind of led you to believe that. And I'm gonna actually show you with some data that we can actually show that from August ago. So this was a study published in 2012. We have a weather station since 1913 here in Abisko, but we've put out tons of weather stations all around the Tornatres, up and down the mountains. And what they did was they wanted to model how the climate has changed between 1913 and 2008 in the case of this study. Now, one definition we have of the Arctic is, of course, that you have 24-hour daylight in the summer. Is that right? 24-hour darkness in the winter, which we have in Abisko right now, but you don't have till what, tomorrow or the next day in Kiona. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, it, for a scientist, though, a more meaningful definition of the Arctic or the cryosphere is that the mean annual temperature should be below zero. So there it is, below zero. So when we model, using all that climate data, 1913, the only places where the temperature was above zero was right around the edge of the lake. But by 2008, look how that's expanded uphill into the mountains and into the valleys. Okay, so we can see, this is basically a map-based version of that temperature plot that I showed a little bit ago. Now take a look here. A second definition that biologists and ecologists often use for the Arctic or the cryosphere is that the temperature must be 10 degrees or lower in the warmest month of the year, which is almost always July. And what we can see is when we compare that metric, 1913 in green and red, 2008, it hasn't really expanded at all, has it? So what this actually demonstrates is the climate is warming in the winter, not the summer. That's quite clear. Does everybody see that? Because that's really important. Now, what are some of the implications of that? If it was just getting warmer in the summertime, you might be, have better conditions for growing your tomatoes. You might not, because maybe you need a long, longer period. But what we can see in Abisko is that essentially, since the beginning of our record in 1913 to today, the growing season now is about a month longer. So if you happen to be maybe, say, over 40 or 50 years old in this room, maybe you can remember the dates that you planted your potatoes 30 years ago versus how when, when we plant them today. So that's a meaningful way of thinking about how the winter has changed. Because if it's just warming in the summer, the plants might get taller, you might need to water them more, but it's that longer growing season that allows us to bring up plants and crops and animals to, from the south to live and succeed in these areas. Now, another way that we can look at this change in Abisko, which relates to my research, this is a picture of Nolia in the wintertime in 1925, and here it is today. The tree line has moved upslope. I don't mean an elevation, but upslope by about 230 meters. 
I wanted to put this picture here because it's really fascinating to see how people, you know, did field work and how they, you know, uh, experienced the uh, the Arctic very different than we are. Here we are with our Gore-Tex and our, you know, our high-tech gear, and these guys are wearing wool, and they basically don't complain about the conditions, and we complain about it all the time. So how do we study these climate change impacts? Well, we use natural climate gradients. So think of it this way. If, if, if the Earth was just flat, if it was just a flat surface, if we wanted to study an environmental gradient, basically we would have to maybe set up a study site in Kiona, then we might go further north up to Karaswando and set one up, we might go to Karakames and set one up, and we might go to Svalbard. But thankfully the world is not perfectly flat. Essentially, when you have mountains, you have conditions like this around Kiona, where you have some pine forest. But then you move up into the mountains where you have shrubs and no trees. And you move up even higher into the high alpine regions where you have very little vegetation at all. It's not that there's no life here, but we have a gradient. And that gradient relates to temperature and precipitation. So remember that Nolia gradient? In Abasco, I literally can use a 3.4 kilometer gradient from the tourist station up to the summit of Nolia to study the same range of environmental conditions that you would get from here to the far north of Norway. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And then, of course, we do experiments. So I want to show you a couple of different scientific studies and explain what we're doing in Abasco and in the Swedish mountains to illustrate the changes that are happening and then the, and, and then the way that we might actually approach trying to understand those changes and what they mean. So remember we talked about those environmental gradients. When we go to these high mountain lakes, we take a big bucket of water like that. It's nice and clear. The lake is clear. The sunlight penetrates all the way to the bottom. You have a lot of Arctic char in those lakes. They're delicious to eat. They're fun to fish for. Well, most of the, uh, the uh, inputs of things like carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus basically come from the land around the lakes. So essentially the snow melts or the rain brings those nutrients into those lakes. And when you have very little vegetation around those lakes, you have a limited amount of nutrients around those lakes. And that means that essentially not just do you have a particular fish community that might look like this, but you have some level of carbon dioxide and methane emissions that might look like that. But as the climate warms, and this is the one thing that I want to keep talking about throughout the talk, is think about climate change at this latitude as increasing biological productivity. So what do I mean by that? It means that the high mountain lakes without vegetation become more like those low alpine lakes that have shrubs. And those low, those, those low alpine areas that just have shrubs start to have trees. And the birch forest starts to get replaced by the pine forest. That's what I mean by a change in the biological productivity. And this is what we're seeing in Swedish lakes, is that as our climate warms, the vegetation community or the biological productivity increases, which means you get more nutrient runoff, which makes the water browner, which means the sunlight can't penetrate to the bottom of the lake. There's less oxygen in the lake. You get fewer of the fish that we like to eat, and you get more emissions of carbon dioxide and methane. Here's a map of Sweden and the lakes that are surveyed for fish. And here's a model that one of our researchers, Kathy Hines, did in 2012, where she looked at the distribution of Arctic char. And then she projected what that distribution might look like in the future. And that future projection at the end of the century suggests that there might be about a 73% reduction in the number of lakes with char. And I forgot to mention this when I showed the Nolia plot, where I showed those two pictures of Nolia with the tree line expansion. It's extremely rare. You should be skeptical any time a scientist or any time somebody says, look, the temperature's gone up and we see this linear response. That's just not how nature works. The reason why I put the, art, the, the, the pike here is because the pike, with the warming conditions, is able to expand into some of these lakes through the river connections. So what's happening is the Arctic char is not declining simply because of this increase in biological productivity which changes how the lakes look. It's also happening because you're getting this invader from the south and from the east. 
Okay? And just I just want to go back to the Nolia story one more time. Remember I told you the tree line has moved about 230 meters upslope? That would not have happened if the climate hadn't warmed. But it also wouldn't have happened if the Sami haven't changed the way they did their reindeer herding. A hundred years ago, they did intensive herding, which meant that, the reindeer, the, that there were people spending time with the reindeer intensively, and they would keep them at the tree lines where you have the low vegetation that's very good to eat, okay? You take away the reindeer, and then all of those vegetation just starts to explode. So it's an interaction. So this is an interaction between, for example, temperature, biological productivity, invasions of fish, and that tree line expansion is the same thing. It's an interaction between temperature and things like changing how reindeer are herded. Now I'm going to give you two uh, experiments uh, uh, that, I, that I think are really important. And maybe you as people from Kiona know this, or most of you are from the, the Kiona area. But we have permafrost. How many people here did not know we had permafrost around here? Raise your hand if you didn't know we had permafrost. Well, that's pretty good, but I guess you're a pretty educated crowd. Often in Sweden, people have no idea that we have permafrost in Sweden. Many of these permafrost areas are these kind of mires or peat areas. And uh, essentially, permafrost is this permanently frozen carbon, if you will. It's, it's soil that's frozen and nothing's happening to it. It's been frozen for at least a couple of years. Now, we want to know how does increasing temp temperatures affect carbon emissions. Now let's take a step back. We know that you know, the carbon emissions from fossil fuels, for example, are being trapped in the atmosphere, and then of course we get more warming. But did you know that when we increase the temperature of the planet and we get an increase in biological productivity, we also get an increase in natural emissions, which are the things that the decomposers, the microbial community, the bacteria, the fungi, the animals that live in the soil, they eat the dead stuff. They release carbon dioxide and methane through de decomposition. Whereas we actually have some CO2 being taken up by the plants. So a really important question for us is, do the plants take up more carbon dioxide than is being given off by all those processes such as decomposition, or is decomposition overwhelming the amount of carbon dioxide that's going in? So we, we call that source sink dynamics. So do peatlands function as a source or a sink? If it's a source, it means that decomposition is producing more carbon dioxide and methane than is going in through photosynthesis. If it's a sink, the plants are doing a great job. And as it turns out right now, the plants are doing a great job. Most of the ecosystems up here are a sink. So what, how can we test these ideas under a warming planet to whether the, these ecosystems will stay a source for a sink in the future? Well, we can use these open top chambers. It's essentially a greenhouse. If you guard it and you have a greenhouse, you know that a greenhouse can be a lovely place to be in March and April because it feels quite warm in there. Well, what you're experiencing is passive warming. The wind is blocked, and the glass traps the solar radiation. So here's a simple plot of a given day in the summertime. Here's 24 hours, so here's the middle of the day. We have thermometers inside of our plot, and we have thermometers outside of our plot. I want to take a step back. When you start thinking about an experiment, I want to make sure you understand what I mean by an experiment. Because an experiment isn't just going out and, for example, putting, you know, let's say, let's say you're in Barcelona in July, like I was this year, unfortunately, because it was really hot. You can take an egg and you can crack it and put it on the sidewalk and you can cook an egg. You could call that an experiment, couldn't you? That's a reasonable experiment. Is it hot enough to cook an egg? Well, when we do experiments, we actually use something like an open top chamber, for example, to increase the warming in a very local spot. But we have to compare that to something, and we call that a control. So think about cancer research, for example. If I develop a drug to treat a type of cancer, I don't find one person with that disease and give them the pill and then see if they're cured. I go out and find 5,000 people, or maybe more. I divide them into two groups, a control group and an experimental group. I give you all a pill. 
You have no idea what pill you have. And then we measure how well that pill does relative to the control, the, the experimental drug. And in this case, when we do experiments, we measure the same things outside the, the experiments in what we call a control. So what we can see here on this plot here is the black square and circle where it represents the treatment or the experiment, and the hollow one is the control. And what we can see is over the spring and the summer, the air temperature from an open top chamber, if you average these 24 hour days for the whole growing season, if you average that, you get about a degree of warming inside one of those open top chambers. And that's, that, that's good. And the reason why it's good is that's pretty much the, 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 the level of warming that we're kind of experiencing right now at the decadal level and that we expect it will happen in future decades. And then the below ground temperatures are a little bit different but very similar. So what these open top chambers do is they actually do a very good job of approximating the type of temperature changes that we would expect to see in the future. Now here's the experimental design. There's the control where we measure all the same things that we measure inside the plots or the, open, the, the uh, open top chambers. We have some open top chambers that we use only in the summer. We have some that we use in the summer and some that we add snow in the winter time. Now why would we add snow? Snow is a good insulator, isn't it? If you think about the, if you've been out skiing in some of the mires around here, for example, a lot of snow doesn't accumulate there because the wind keeps that snow from accumulating. So if you were to measure the temperature at the ground level, it's pretty close to the temperature of the air. But now go into the forest where the snow is trapped by the trees and the shrubs, and you get nice deep snow. It can be minus 40 in Rinchum or in Nicolopia. You dig down to the bottom of that snow, and it can be pretty close to zero. Isn't that amazing? So what we can do is we can use the properties of snow to also see what the effect of winter warming is simply by dumping piles of snow on top. And then we have a third treatment, which is these open top chambers in the spring and the summer, and then adding snow in the winter. So we're measuring the carbon going in through photosynthesis in the summertime. And we're measuring the carbon going out, which again is primarily done decomposition. Remember bacteria, you know, fungi, you know, those kinds of things. Animals that live in the soil that eat the dead stuff. So here's the results. Here's our control. These are not to scale, but it's relative, okay? We find that all three treatments have a significant increase in that net ecosystem respiration. That's what we call it. The amount of CO2 going in and going out versus the control. And I want to put this into context for you, because after the fourth year of the study, all three of the treatments increase these respiration rates, meaning more CO2 going in and coming out. Now, if we were to take habitats that look like this, and we were to look at Google Earth, for example, and find all of those places at the northerly latitudes that have these peat soils, it only represents about 2% of the land on Earth but it contains one-third of the soil organic carbon. So re remember, when we talk about CO2, or we talk about methane, that's carbon. They're just different kind of species of carbon, if you will. Think of it this way. If you take a pencil, the lead of the pencil, that's the same thing as a diamond, isn't it? They're both carbon. They're just different forms of carbon based on their properties, uh, you know, or, or based on their properties. So if 2% of the soils contain one-third of the world's soil carbon, and warming increases the amount of CO2 that's being released, that could be a problem. This study demonstrates that this soil carbon is highly sensitive to warming and has long-lasting effects. So one of the things that the, this researcher from our group did was then they took that 2% of the world map and they did some calculations based on the amount of ecosystem respiration going out. And they estimated how much one degree of warming would result in increased emissions per year. And that range was 38 to 100 megatons. Now it's a range, and why is it a range? Because the, when they measured each one of these open top chambers, and there was about 30 open top chambers, they don't have the same value. 
And the reason why they don't have the same value is the conditions aren't exactly the same in each open top chamber. So then they get this range here. Now, 38 to 100 megatons, let's take that apart a little bit. A megaton sounds like a lot. But whenever you see something that says like billion tons, megatons, gigatons, I want you to immediately stop worrying and just put the word units there. Because you know nothing. Nobody has compared what that megaton means. Like a megaton of salt might not be that much relative to a megaton of something that's very rare. Okay? So a megaton is just a unit. Now 38 to 100, the high value is almost three times as the low value. Do you see that? That's a lot of uncertainty, isn't it? So like when you see a big number like this, and it might be reported in the news, they'll say, look at all the uncertainty here. 38 to 100 megatons. But what does uncertainty mean? Well, for most of you, uncertainty means on Friday night, do I get pizza or do I get Thai food? But that's not what uncertainty means in science. This low value here has a probability attached to it. So what do I mean by that? We can say that this low value, we are 95% confident that that will be the minimum amount that will happen with one degree of warming. So essentially, let's just take that as a fact, okay? Because that's what it is. But this 100 value has a probability. And even if it's only 1% chance, you have to ask yourself, what's the risk of that high value? Because that's the real question here. You know, if, if, if the risk of 100 megatons being released was essentially that the planet would warm by, you know, 0 0.0001 degree, maybe that's not important. But if it adds a degree of warming, it could be quite significant. So it's the risk that's associated with how we should treat this high value. Now I need to create the context for these units. Remember I mentioned that? So I've talked about what the low value and the high value means, what uncertainty means, that we need to replace megatons with units, and I'm going to create the context for those units. How many people here remember the Kyoto Protocol? So do you remember that? 1997. It was the precursor to the, uh, to the uh, Paris Agreement. All of the European countries committed to cutting 92 megatons per year. So in total, not Sweden, not Germany, all European countries committed to cutting 92 megatons. And do you know what? We didn't do it. So one degree of warming could actually potentially increase the amount of carbon emissions into our atmosphere by more than we would have saved if we would have done what we said we were going to do under the Kyoto Protocol. That's a problem, isn't it? So global warming causes long-lasting positive feedback. So when I say positive feedback, I don't mean something good. In this case, what I mean is that as this climate warms, Permafrost thaws, in the case of these peatland soils, or the biological activity increases where you don't have permafrost. And it results in more carbon going in the atmosphere, which causes more heat to be trapped, which causes more warming, which causes more permafrost to thaw, or soils, you know, biological activity in the soil. And, and, and that's really important because I think most people forget. They seem to think that when we eventually get around to ending burning fossil fuels, that once we flip that switch, it solves the problem. But that's not true. Did you know that the Paris Agreement is two things? It's about, it's about getting to net zero as quickly as possible to try to get to 1.5 degrees or, or, or 2 degrees. But the second thing is negative emissions. Has anybody heard of negative emissions? Okay, negative emissions isn't driving your cars backwards, okay? I think that's what people think if they know what it means. Negative emissions means we have to take it out of the atmosphere. So if you live in Umeå, and I apologize, I don't live in Kiona, so I don't know how much a bus pass costs here, but in Umeå, a bus cost, pass costs around 800 crowns per month. Now imagine if you have a car and you were to pay the true carbon cost of driving your car, one liter of fuel might not be 15 kroner for one liter, but it actually might be something like 15,000 crowns per kroner, I mean per liter. Because essentially, what we burn, we eventually have to take back out. Because if we wait for the Earth's natural cycles to take it out, we're talking on an order of 100 to 400,000 years. 
And I don't think we're going to be around to see that. Now I want to show you another experiment in the permafrost Myers. And again, the reason why I talk about permafrost is this is something that we have here, and this permafrost plays a major part in our Earth's climate system. So what are the, incre what are the effects of increasing snow depth? Well, I already mentioned about the effects of snow insulating the ground. Permafrost, again, is the Earth material that's frozen for at least two years. In the winter, all of our soils look like this. Sometimes I can't imagine how they can do construction in the wintertime when they have to dig through this concrete. But in the summertime, an active layer forms. By September, the earth has stored a lot of heat in the soils and the active layers at its deepest. Here's a core from permafrost mire. You can see the permafrost here and the active layer above there. This is where the biological life is taking place. Okay? Now, Warming increases biological productivity. I said that before. So when you start talking about these tundra areas, or these mires, or these fjell, or the alpine areas, what's happening is, as it gets warmer, the shrubs and the trees invade. And if you look back here in the back part of the picture, or just think about the places that you might spend time around here, the wind doesn't allow snow to accumulate in these big open areas, does it? So again, the air temperature is very similar at the ground and above the ground. But once these shrubs invade, you get an expansion of these shrubs. Now, scientists call this shrubification. We like to invent words to increase the citation rates of our papers, so we have a word for that. But again, the ground temperature under the snow is not linked to the air temperature once the snow reaches about a meter. So just go out and do an experiment. You know, if you've got a house where the snow accumulates on one side, put a thermometer at the ground and then have one above, especially on one of those really cold days, and you'll see there's that really stark difference. So in Store Flocket, which is a mire about 10 kilometers from Obisco to the east, they did a little, they've done an experiment that's been going on now for many years, since 2004, where essentially what they've done is they've put, uh, they've put up uh, snow fences. And so think of a snow fence as an artificial shrub. So that snow fence essentially does what a shrub does, is it traps the snow. And you can see a picture. This is a picture in uh, late April near Obisco, and you can see the snow fence where the artificial shrub is very effective at trapping the snow. And just like all good experiments, you can see there's controls, and then there's the letter M, which is manipulations. Okay. Now this is something that I often use as a good case, uh, case study uh, for how to communicate science, because this was just taken from the publication. If you're a scientist and you use the word manipulated, it means that you've basically just done something to change the conditions. But if you're the public, what does manipulated mean? It means something very different, doesn't it? So I suggest in the future, if any of you become scientists, don't use the word manipulate, just use the word treatment or experiment. Because that's a much better way of getting the public to understand what you do. Now, there's no surprise. Look at the results here. The black is always the control, the gray is always the snow fences. This is year, year after year after year after year, snow depth. The snow depth increases. That's not a surprise. Everybody who has a house, you know, the, the snow accumulates on one side. Your house is essentially a giant barrier. You can accumulate snow. So that's not a shock. So you can, again, you can see this picture in late April. There's hardly any snow in this permafrost mire except where the snow fences are. And take a look here, the black is the control again, and indeed, the below ground temperature is warmer wherever you have snow. So we're increasing the winter temperatures of these soils, which leads to, this is one of our researchers measuring the active layer, so we don't do something high tech, we just basically go out there with a ruler, and we poke it into the ground and we measure the active layer depth in September, and what you can see is that after the first year, the active layer gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, what does that mean if the active layer is getting deeper? That means the permafrost is thawing. And the previous study was, was given first to illustrate what happens when that permafrost thaws. When that permafrost thaws, you get an increase in that biological productivity, which increases the amount of ecosystem system respiration, the amount of carbon going out from decomposition, but also the amount of carbon going in from uh, biological activities such as photosynthesis. Now, this is another point that I like to point out that the climate skeptics are correct. If you have a warmer climate, 
and you have an atmosphere with more CO2, and in this case you've thawed permafrost, look at this, the plants do get bigger. Isn't that amazing? They do get bigger. But the problem is these are not redwood trees, are they? They're not basically growing and storing carbon for 500 years. If you know cotton grass, this is a, basically a plant that grows up and the top just dies off every year. And then, of course, that material that dies is then decomposed. Wherever you have those snow fences, not only is the snow deeper in the, in the wintertime and the ground temperature is warmer, the active layer in the summer gets deeper and deeper, but the ground starts to sink and you get these thaw ponds to form. And this is where we get to the critical point of these two studies. Because as the permafrost thaws, and in these, in these areas, for example, that aren't well drained, some areas they are well drained where the water would move away from that local spot. Look at this. When you have a warming climate like we've had, so this experiment was going on while the planet has been warming, while the Arctic has been warming, Look, we still have more CO2 going in, meaning photosynthesis is doing us a favor, than is going out. A little bit of methane going out, but we still have what we call a sink. The balance is in our favor. But look what happens the moment you get these thaw ponds. It switches. You get more CO2 going out and more methane. Now, think about units. Methane is equal to 25 carbon dioxide. So it might be more rare in the atmosphere, but it's 25 times as strong a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. So it has some really big implications. Now, how many people here eat reindeer meat? I, I eat reindeer meat. I mean, you can't eat anything more local than that, right? How about moose meat? Char? Arctic char? All right. This is why you should be concerned about this. About this. Because essentially what happens is, as this permafrost soil thaws, we have trace elements, meaning you know, things like uh, mercury, in the soil everywhere. But what matters is what happens to that mercury. So if it just stays in the soil and nothing happens to it, it pretty much doesn't have an effect on us. But when it gets mobilized, as this permafrost thaws and the decomposition increases, you get methylmercury being produced, which is a neurotoxin. And it moves up the food web. So it could be that in 50 years, or 100 years, or 1,000 years, I don't know. I can't speculate. But some point in the future, as our planet warms, places like these will become spots that bring mercury into the food web. That might mean that we won't have a choice but to be vegetarian or to eat some kind of meat that grows in a dish from a factory. Now here's the distribution of permafrost globally. So here we are in Amisco. We're right at the edge of the continuous permafrost, discontinuous permafrost region. Here's Siberia. Take a look here. The permafrost in Amisco is tens of meters thick. So if we go from Kiona to Wisconsin, we have about 12 long-term monitoring sites. We've been monitoring since the late 70s. The permafrost is tens of meters thick. It's about 2,000, 2,500 years old. The permafrost here can be 1,400 meters thick, okay? And it can be hundreds of thousands of years old. And the main reason for that is, even during the ice ages, this area was frozen, but it wasn't glaciated. And what happens here is because we had two kilometers of ice above us, when that ice melted and receded, it scraped away a lot of the soil. But in there, you don't have those processes. That's why our soils are young, and their soils are quite old. Now, to put those two studies into context, not just peatlands, but if we go to these permafrost peatlands, or permafrost soils now, not peatland soils, but just permafrost soils, they only represent about 12% of the global soils. There's about a thousand billion tons in the top three meters. Now why do I only talk about the top three meters? Well that's because it's not like water where we can kind of use a sonar or a radar to measure the, the, the shape of the, the lake or the ocean. We have to drill holes. So we've dug thousands and thousands of holes around our planet and what we've done is realize that it's, it's a really tough question to ask. 
how much permafrost is there. But what we can do is we can come up with an estimate based on the top three meters. And again, substitute billion tons for units, because now I have to create that context for you. That top three meters of soil, which represents 12% of the soils globally, contains 50% of all the soil carbon. That's a lot, isn't it? That's twice what's in the atmosphere today. As of December 6th, just a few days ago, the measurement from the Mauna Loa Observatory was 411 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's about 100 parts per million higher than any time in the entire evolution of all human species. So not just Homo sapiens, not just Homo neanderthalus, or divisians if you're familiar with them as well, but Homo erectus, Homo habilis. No Homo species has lived in a climate like we are creating today. Now, of course, there's, climate change is a historical problem, meaning that we have 410 parts or 411 parts per million but we've only had about a degree of warming globally, and that's because it's happened in such a short period of time. The ocean has taken about 90% of that warming. About a third of the carbon dioxide that we've released, the ocean has sucked it in. And the ocean has a great ocean conveyor belt where it redistributes heat around the planet. So the ocean is this amazing benefit to society that most of you don't realize, or most people don't realize. So our future, if we want to understand our future, we need to think about what was it the last time we had 411 parts per million in the atmosphere. We have to go back two and a half, three million years ago to the Pliocene before any of those human species existed. The Earth's average temperature was six to nine degrees warmer than it is today. The sea level was 15 to 25 meters higher than it is today. That's what this research means. That's why we need to be concerned about the permafrost because we're already sitting at a trajectory of three to four degrees warming globally by the end of this century. And don't forget that when we talk about one and a half degrees or two degrees, those are arbitrary numbers. So let's say that somehow magically, let's just say that you know, Aladdin exists and magically we transition our economies and we get to one and a half degrees at the end of the century. The day after that, it's still going to be warming. And the day after that, it's still going to be warming. So until we start taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and we stop putting it in there, we've got a problem. But the problem is compounded by these natural feedback mechanisms. Today, we forecast that 13 to 28% of this permafrost will thaw by 2050. That's amazing, isn't it? And again, remember, I've, I've explained what this uncertainty means here. The lower number is a fact. The upper number has a probability. It could be 1% or 5%, I don't know, but it's possible. And that should be the number that we're most concerned with. The other thing that you may not realize, just like, remember when I was talking about negative emissions, that's part of the story that doesn't get reported on in the news? The other thing is, the climate models that we use to negotiate the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Agreement, did you know they don't include these kind of feedbacks? So even if we were to stop all of our emissions today, remember there's so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, unless we remove it, it's going to keep warming for decades, for centuries, for millennia, which is going to cause this to cause more warming and more warming for decades, centuries, millennia. So let's not forget that, that the climate models that are used to negotiate these treaties are not perfect. And when I say they're not perfect, it doesn't mean that like sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong in some kind of random way which would suggest that the models just don't work. They are too conservative. So we're, we're trusting our policymakers right now in Spain to negotiate the next phase of the Paris Agreement based on imperfect knowledge. Isn't that amazing? Has anybody seen this place before? Look at this. This is a permafrost crater. These are people in Siberia. Remember I told you the permafrost can be 1,400 meters thick? Look at that. Those are people. You can see it from space. 
So if you just Google this, you will see this permafrost crater from space. It's the largest, it's not the only one. If you go to Canada and Alaska, you don't tend to see permafrost craters. What you see are brown circles where the permafrost has disappeared and all the lakes drain themselves because it's like pulling the plug on a bathtub. Okay? This, again, is a story of interactions. Because it turns out that this permafrost just, just didn't th simply thaw because of the, of the warming but because they, start, they built a road through here and they started logging it. And what happens is when you remove the forest canopy that creates shade in the summertime, it allows that warming to increase even more. So it was again an interaction between forestry and global warming that's led to this and many other craters around the world. So this is kind of where I get to my stopping point the Arctic region gives off more heat to space than it absorbs. Now, I don't mean gives it off as if like there's some kind of heating element stored and it gives it off to space. What I mean is that when the surface is white, snow and ice, glaciers, sea ice, lake ice, when that sun's energy hits the surface, it reflects up. Okay, if the growing season is a month longer now, some of that month means there's no snow on the ground, no ice on the lakes, 44 more days now. So that means that the Earth is absorbing instead of giving the heat off. But right now, the Arctic is still doing a good job for our planet. The Arctic serves as the Earth's cooling system for the planet. Just like the Antarctica does, just like the Greenland ice sheet does, just like the Himalayas do. So the changes that happen in the Arctic are significant globally. So that's my talk. I hope you found it interesting. If you have questions, you know, we have a few minutes, but then we can have Fika, you can track me down and ask me that question if maybe you're a little shy. I apologize, my Swedish is terrible. But I will do my best, so thanks. Feedback phenomena in the Arctic that work in the other direction? Well, that would be called a negative feedback. Okay. So, are there negative feedbacks on our planet? Absolutely. I mean, think about the ocean absorbing heat. You know, but the problem is, is that there's a certain point where the ocean will stop absorbing heat. I mean, think about biological productivity. As long as you know, photosynthesis is increasing and taking in more CO2 than is being given off by decomposition. You know, that would be the negative part, what's going in. But of course, there's tipping points for both positive and negatives. So, yes, there are negative feedbacks. But right now, we live in a world where the not negative feedbacks are absolutely overwhelmed by what we've done as humans. And now what's starting to happen across our planet in terms of these positive feedbacks. Does that answer your question? And you had a question. Yes, sir. When uh, you have a small ice age, yes. uh, where it's uh, war warmer from other places on the Earth. Yes. So, uh, could it be an ice age now with this global warming? Uh, most likely not. Because the other thing, too, is think about it this way. When we talk about one degree of warming over the entire surface of the planet that we've had since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, that one degree is actually somewhat of a meaningless number because most humans don't live in the ocean and the ocean is 71% of the planet. So if you talk about warming that's taken place over land, it's been twice that. So when we start talking about the temperature increases in the Arctic as one and a half, two and a half degrees compared to the global average, in some places in the Arctic, the, 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 the warming over land has been six, nine, even 15 degrees warmer. It's not, I mean, of course, it's, the, the landscape is not a flat surface. So, you know, the measurement in Svalbard and Longyearbyen will not be the same as the measurement in Abisko. But in all of those places, the warming is far exceeding. And the other thing, too, is that winter warming is important. Because it turns out, and I have a slide here that I can show you. I always have two stopping points in my talks because uh, I can be a bit long-winded and sometimes I need to explain things a little bit better. All right, so now I just need to find this slide. 
apologize, it's not too far from here. So this is a slide that shows essentially um, carbon dioxide in blue. The hot, when you have lots of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you have an interglacial period. When you have very little carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you have an ice age. And we can measure that going back with the ice cores, going back almost one million years, so about 800,000 years. And we can see this beautiful cycle of warming and cooling, all right? And the temperature follows that very nicely. Now, it doesn't follow it perfectly, and that's because of something called the Milankovitch cycle. There's three aspects of our Earth's orbit around the sun that determine how much heat we get in the summer versus the winter. And that's important in terms of when ice ages start or when they disappear. So this precession is on a 20,000 year cycle, obliquity is on the 40,000 year cycle, and the eccentric orbit, meaning the elliptical orbit there, is a 100,000 year cycle. And so here what we can see is that deglaciation, but it would be the opposite in a glaciating period, is not initiated by carbon dioxide, but by this. So it's just a small change in the radiation budget of our planet that makes it a little bit warmer, which then and which starts off these processes that start releasing CO2 naturally, like thawing permafrost, for example, or the sea ice melting back, and then the ocean absorbing more heat. So that explains the warming that's not caused by this, which causes the spreading throughout the planet. So I think I'm trying to answer your question that, that with the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, unless we have some kind of super volcano that goes off that puts out billions and billions of tons, of sulfides into the atmosphere, or unless we have, um, you know, some kind of meteor that hits the Earth, it, it's just not going to happen. I mean, we understand. I mean, climate change is chemistry and physics and fluid dynamics. Those are not debated topics. You know, the ecology of and 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 the intricacies of those fine little natural cycle changes that are those are hard. But on these big scales of ice ages. And, not, and, and interglacial periods, it's pretty well understood. And what's not well understood is that if you have, let me go backwards, this one doesn't, oh, he does have a back, backwards arrow. If you go, if you go back in, hey, let's see. If you go back in time, essentially, you never have carbon dioxide levels above 300 parts per million through this entire glacial, interglacial cycle that goes back almost a million years. So the, 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 the models that are based on this physics, this chemistry, the fluid dynamics of our planet tell us that unless we have negative emissions and we stop releasing carbon dioxide and methane into our atmosphere, nitrous oxide, other things, we will not have another ice age for one to 400,000 years. Now that doesn't mean that it won't be cooler in some places on the planet than others, but we will not have an ice age. That is a fact. Any other questions? I think you guys want to need some Pika, and then uh, you can come up to me and ask your questions. Well, thank you.